Well, uh, the next session is an interesting session. It's a thyroid symposium. And the first speaker uh, has uh, is Professor Shudeep Chatterjee, a case of Graves' disease with pregnancy. Uh, Professor Chatterjee is one of the pioneers of endocrinology. Uh, and he is a consultant endocrinologist, Institute of Reproductive Medicine, Kolkata, visiting physician, Department of Medicine, Ramakrishna Mission, Shiva Pratishtan, and honorary professor of medicine, Vivekananda Institute of Medical Sciences. He is an EC member and treasurer of IDEA Kolkata and member governing body of JC Bose National Science Talent Search Kolkata. He is a speaker and chairperson in the annual conferences in the Endocrine Society of India and RSSDI, regular speaker in CME programs, chairperson, scientific committee and Endocrine Society of Kolkata, 2000C, thesis guide for MD and DNB and reviewer for the Journal of Diabetes, Journal of Indian Medical Association and Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecological Society of India. 50 plus articles and six book chapters, but without much ado, over to Professor Shudeep Chatterjee. And this is uh, Professor Shudeep Chatterjee, who is uh, uh, will be discussing hyperthyroidism in pregnancy. So, sir, is of uh, I have already uh, read out his CV slide earlier, but in brief, he is a consultant endocrinologist and a professor to the Department of Medicine. Uh, prolific uh, has fifty plus a prolific speaker in all the national and in, uh, even in international levels and he has got 50 plus publications and is an examiner of thesis for MD and DNB. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shoma Prato. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and talk about something other than diabetes for a change. Uh, I will actually uh, just go through a patient of mine who had hyperthyroidism and was contemplating pregnancy. And let us see what happens to her during her journey. The problem with hyperthyroidism is, next slide, there is no perfect treatment. Next. So the problem is there is no treatment that will keep the patient permanently euthyroid, which is unfortunately what the patient wants. So our target we have to settle for is that the patient has to be made hypothyroid and then replace the patient with thyroxine from outside. So that's what we do. This can be done either by drugs or I-131 or surgery. Next. Now, what I have seen is that uh, if we give carbimazole, which is the standard drug really, uh, hardly 20% of the patients eventually reach hypothyroidism. They remain euthyroid for a while, then the TSH keeps going down and they again relapse. So ultimately, we have to either keep them on permanent carbimazole, which is not very desirable, or offer radioiodine or surgery. Next. So this is my patient. You see, the patient data are in red. And the uh, uh, scientific data are in blue. Uh, this lady, 27 years old, had hyperthyroidism for six months and came to me while on carbimazole, 20 milligrams a day, and propranolol, 20 milligrams a day. Her thyroid receptor antibody was strongly positive, which actually suggests that she's unlikely to go into remission with carbimazole. She had a small goiter, normal eyes, normal skin, normal club fingers, no clubbing, and she wanted to conceive. So, well, propranolol was stopped, and this is quite interesting about propranolol. Next slide, please. These beta blockers in hyperthyroidism. Next one. They are useful if the patient presents with a high output cardiac failure, which they sometimes do. Next one. It gives, they give symptomatic relief from tachycardia. Propranolol is our favorite because as we have been taught, it inhibits conversion of T4 to T3, which none of the other beta blockers do. But the problem is that because of a first pass hepatic metabolism, 
if you really want to achieve beta blockade in a hyperthyroid patient, you will have to give doses like 160 to up to 320 milligrams a day, which is something we find very difficult to give actually. And uh, as the euthyroidism kicks in, we have to reduce the dose. And a dose of 20 milligrams or 10 milligrams is basically uh, no better than placebo. So it's best to stop it. Next one, atenolol. If I give beta blockers, I generally give atenolol because it does not have a first pass hepatic metabolism. It is water soluble and it does not require any dose escalation in hyperthyroidism. But however, in this patient, because she's wanting pregnancy, she's actually euthyroid on uh, carbamazole, there was no need to give any beta blocker at all. Next one. So talking to the patient, the common problem that these patients have is they're very scared of having a mentally affected child. So the counseling, even if they don't say that, I think uh, as a doctor, one should bring it up because this is really at the back of their minds. So there is really little chance of having a mentally affected baby. However, and this is important, although rare, the antithyroid medication can cause birth defects during organogenesis which is really the first eight to 10 months of uh, eight to 10 weeks, uh, max 12 weeks of intrauterine life. Now, the rare data that we have on birth defects show that defects attributed to propyl thiouracil or PTU, which is available in the market, are less serious than those attributed to carbimazole. So the plan as discussed with the patient was to start folate uh, you know, as a standard thing to prevent neural tube defects, nothing to do with the thyroid state and change carbamazole to PTU 50 milligrams three times a day from the cycle when she will start trying for a baby. So that was done. Now, just to know what are the birth defects, it's very rare, but PTU has been associated with hydronephrosis renal cyst, branchial cyst, branchial fistula, branchial sinus, preauricular sinus in the ear. Whereas carbamazole has been associated with coanal atresia, esophageal atresia, umbilicocele, abdominal wall defects, aplasia cutis, abnormal facies, VST, and some vague renal or eye defects. Uh, although very rare, these are recorded. So basically, next slide please. Uh, the prefer to give PTU for the first three months as a maximum, but the PTU is a drug that is associated with sudden liver failure and death. Now, this is very serious, and there are patients in the United States who have had liver transplant because they were on PTU. There is no such serious outcome long-term with carbamazole. So the basic idea is during organogenesis, max for the first trimester, the patient can have PTU. This is probably the only indication of PTU today. And then switch to carbamazole from the second trimester onwards. So this was done. Next one. And lo and behold, the pregnancy test was positive after two months. So the patient continued on PTU 50 milligrams three times a day. She was told to check her free T4 and TSH every six weeks. At the end of 12 weeks from the LMP, the PTU was stopped and carbamazole 15 milligrams per day was started. There's a little box on the right hand side where something interesting is being shown. Uh, at the bottom is the weeks of gestation. The blue line is the TSH, which actually comes down around about the 10 weeks of gestation. The reason is, that at that time, the HCG goes up. This is normal. HCG has one five hundred. the TSH-like effect of TSH. So if you have a very high level of HCG that behaves like TSH, can cause worsening of the hyperthyroidism very rarely. And the TSH, obviously, physiology gets suppressed. The blue line goes down, and then again comes up. Uh, as the HCG comes down, which always happens around about the 18 weeks of gestation and so on. So this is something worth knowing. Uh, next one. 
Now, this is just to show that what crosses the placenta, thyroid-releasing hormone, or TRH, which is a tripeptide, not very relevant, crosses the placenta. The anti-thyroid drugs cross the placenta. Thyroid TSH receptor stimulating antibody crosses the placenta. So this can actually affect the fetal thyroid and make it overactive. The thyroglobulin antibodies and iodine cross the placenta. And what we didn't know earlier, but we know now, is that T3 and T4 also cross the placenta. What, what doesn't cross the placenta is the TSH and thyroglobulin as a whole, which is not really relevant. But to know is that the antibody crosses the placenta, which can have various effects. And if you have too much of the other antibodies, TPO and thyroglobulin, maybe they can produce fetal hypothyroidism. So it's an unpredictable situation during pregnancy, depending on what exactly is transferred across, across the placenta in a given case. Next one. So basically everything crosses the placenta except TSH, thyroid stimulating, thyroid receptor, TSH receptor stimulating antibody can stimulate the fetal thyroid. PTU and cabimazole can cause fetal hypothyroidism. What we didn't know earlier is that the thyroid hormones can cross. So the fetal thyroid state really depends not only on what the fetal thyroid is producing from say 10 weeks of uh, gestation, and also it depends on what sort of antibodies and drugs have actually crossed over to the placenta at a given time. So this is a little unpredictable, but this is a standard situation really. Next one, please. So what thyroid tests do we do? Next. The TBG levels go up in pregnancy and albumin levels fall. This is normal. So the total T4 goes up because the thyroid binding globulin goes up and typically the value can go up by 50%, total T4. Free T4 kits that are widely used make some assumptions. They do not take into account that the TBG goes up and the albumin falls during pregnancy. So these assumptions may not always be good. The American Thyroid Association says you go by chromatography or dialysis, and these are absolutely impossible things to do, even in the United States. But just to be safe, they advise that. What we do is that we go by the free T4, because the free T4 is more or less universally understood, and we have, we have other stakeholders in this situation, the patient, patient's access to Google, the obstetrician, and at the end, towards the end, even the pediatrician and the anesthetist. So free T4 is more or less universal because if you go by total T4, we have to uh, reduce mentally the normal values by 50% and explaining all that to our other stakeholders is rather difficult. So I prefer to go by free T4, although I am aware that it is not a perfect test in pregnancy. Next one. Now, the patient has come to the middle of the third trimester, all her fetal markers, ultrasound, ultrasonological and biochemical are normal. The free T4 has been kept at the high end of the normal range. TSH, as expected, is suppressed. The fetal heart rate is slightly high, 150 to 156, which is really a little higher than what we would expect. It is vertex presentation. Now, with a high fetal heart rate, there is a possibility of giving a beta blocker to the mother on the assumption that it will cross the placenta and reduce the fetal heart rate. This was not done in this particular case. Next one. So at the end of 38 weeks, there is persistent fetal tachycardia. The head has not engaged. She, the mother is approaching term, but the head is still floating and the elective CS was decided. Next one. So after the elective CS, the baby boy was born. Apgar at one minute and five minutes, but a little less. They were seven and eight, respectively. I'll tell you why. The weight was 2.3 kilos, not bad. The baby was morphologically normal, no goiter. Cord blood was sent off for T3, T4, and TSH. It was a floppy baby with poor muscles tone and tachycardia. And this is the floppiness of the muscles that actually brought the apgar down. 
Now, why was the baby floppy? Next one. So basically what happens that if you have neonatal hyperthyroidism bordering on failure, cardiac failure, the presenting symptom is actually that of a floppy baby. You don't get any other features. So you have to be aware or the pediatrician has to be aware that a floppy baby in this setting means that the baby is hyperthyroid. And pediatrician was well briefed. So uh, she actually gave the baby intravenous propranolol and some iodine. Now iodinated contrast media, water soluble. This is the only form of iodine that we actually have right now for intravenous use. So empirically that was given. Baby improved, kept in the NICU for two days. He was fed express breast milk. And after two days or 48 hours, baby was sent to the mother and baby was breastfeeding. The baby's thyroid function uh, reports came back. Free T3 was over the range. Free T4 was high. TSH was suppressed, which was what the clinical picture uh, suggested. And uh, this is not going to persist because this is uh, due to transfer of maternal antibodies. Next one. So ultimately, the baby and mother were sent home. Atenola was given to the baby for five days. And as we know, the half-life of T4 in the baby's circulation will not be more than six days. And the half-life of T3 will not be more than one day. The mother was allowed to breastfeed. Her carbimazole was stopped. The baby was checked at one month and at three months. And the baby was euthyroid. One month after CS, the mother turned out again to have a little bit of hyperthyroidism and she was started on carbimazole, five milligrams a day. Now remember, a little bit of carbimazole is uh, variably secreted, may or may not be secreted in breast milk. So what we did, we actually allowed the mother to breastfeed, gave the mother carbimazole and then after two months, that is uh, on the third month of life, the baby was again checked for his thyroid function test because if carbimazole was going into the breast milk, then carbimazole would cause fetal, uh, sorry, neonatal hypothyroidism. That didn't happen. So we were happy and the mother and child have remained well. So that was a rather stormy and difficult case, which went off well, thanks to collaboration between the different medical specialities, uh, endocrinologist, gynecologist, pediatrician, and even the anesthetist. Thank you.